All right. We're going to take the last 15 or 20 minutes tonight and just try to land the plane a little bit. Typically, the next step in your notes would be go through an exposition of the book of 1 Thessalonians. You can watch that in the seminar videos. You can come with pastor to mentor to go to a seminar. You can watch our people disciple each other. You're welcome to come. We have one in September. We have another one in, in February, March. Uh, we have a, uh, an advanced disciple-making seminar um, in October and another one in April. Those advanced seminars are for the churches that just start their own model of what disciple-making is. Because when you find out when you start, Satan's going to throw you his best 15 knuckleballs. You really have no idea what church struggle is until you decide to become a disciple-making church. <laughs> you'll find out like we did that most of the struggles that you do have are probably self-inflicted. It's interesting. But nonetheless, that's another unexpected, God-intended, you know, realization. That's my son's ringtone. <laughs> did you hear it? You recognize it? Each one of my kids, each one of my kids has a, a Disney ringtone per their personality. So we always chuckle when my phone goes off. The kids laugh because they know. He goes, oops, sorry, forgot you were in New York. Way to go, oh my God. The Miami Heat just missed, he's got a, he wants to talk about all his plane flight changes because the Miami Heat called him, told him they want him 10 days early. So it, it's shuffle time. So anyways, Grace Church of Mentors, not the model. It's a model. Do you understand that? This is not a commercial about Grace Church of Mentor. I hope you haven't heard that. Okay? I'm just a dude that has a gift that's in a church that just wants to know how Jesus lived and help people live his life. That's all. It's super simple. God, God has a model for you. Whatever you do, you just got to develop a model. Pray and ask God for wisdom. If we can help by you observe, hearing of and observing our model, if that can help expedite the building of your model here, just with the brief interchanges we've had in the last two nights, you know, God, God can turn this area of New York upside down through you people. If you'll prayerfully consider this and prayerfully do it, and never stop praying. This does not happen if you're going to do this without praying. Okay? Um, but I know there's more than 11 people here interested in at least exploring more of what we could do to have an eternal influence here in Yonkers in the city. And then if you get multiple churches grasping the same thing. I did this full seminar for 20 churches in the city the year before COVID. If there's multiple churches that get this and then you can connect, just watch the Holy Spirit work. You want to know why I know there's more people to be saved? Because the rapture hasn't happened yet. that make sense? I really believe that in God's economy, when that last soul he intended to be saved is saved, that trumpet's going to blow. <laughs> and we'll all be caught up forever to be with him. So, you know, Josh asked a practical question before, and we can wrap up tonight with some practical, with some practical things here. How did we get started? I'm just going to cliff note this for you. Okay, we were so green, we had no idea how to do this. Um, this was germinating in my mind, having grown up in a pastor's home, having gone through Christian education all my life, um, all the way through seminary, finished seminary when I was 32, um, 35, excuse me. Um, 
preaching in tons of Christian camps, tons of Christian schools, tons of churches, tons of universities, primarily studying the Bible, just trying to figure this out. What, it, what is the New Testament church? How is she supposed to function? Why is she here on this earth? All this kind of stuff. And so I asked our church deacons if I could just call a bunch of churches and, and, and see if any church does this disciple-making thing. And I called over 300 churches and took notes on all of them. And none of them had the disciple-making culture. But they all preached the Bible. They all preached the gospel in their services. They weren't apostate. They just didn't have disciple-making. Um, many pastors said, well, we do discipleship, and it's four times a week when I preach. That's our discipleship. So, okay. Right? We do the Great Commission through Vacation Bible School and through our Christian school and, and through our Christmas program and our Easter. I was like, okay. But in my mind, I'm storing up what? Make disciples is not merely reaching and it's not merely teaching. And it's not just institutional. It's personal. Right? It's not something the church does together. It's something you, the church, do individually that's part of a fellowship. Right? Which is part of the living out of your eternal purpose within that fellowship that's overseen by a gifted man to make sure everyone stays focused on this clothesline. Right? So most pastors told me that's what they did. There were two churches that said, when we have a, a group outreach and someone gets saved at the invitation, a vacation Bible school or youth outreach or Christmas show or whatever, then we attach them to a deacon's wife or if it's a man, a deacon, and, and we take them through this one book, this one Bible study book. And I said, okay, what after that? Well, they become a member and they start serving. Go, okay, I guess that's good. But it didn't sound like what we were studying and we were realizing. It was next step, next level stuff, but it wasn't this life on life for life stuff, right? And then as I was studying this, one of our deacons said, you know, pastor, he said, I'm not really sure, but Harry's his name. He said, I think there is a church that I know of in Missouri that um, is doing what we're, we're studying, doing, we're trying to figure out. So he gave me the name and number. I called the guy. I asked the deacon's permission to go down there and just kind of study the church. They said, sure, go. I went down and I met with the, 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 their discipleship pastor and he started to explain what they were doing and it was resonating with me. Okay, I think this is good. It's good, good, good. And he goes, you know what? You're really not going to fully understand it until you see it. He said, it was a Monday night. He said, it was Monday afternoon. He said, join me tonight at our gym, uh, seven o'clock. And he goes, you just need to see our people. All right. Showed up at the gym. Parking lot was full. We talked in the lobby for a little bit. And we went to the side of the gymnasium, and there was double doors like that. And he opened the double doors. And, and uh, the gym was full, you know, of eight-foot folding tables, like all churches have for potlucks or classrooms or whatever. It was full wall-to-wall. Hundreds of chairs, every seat full, right? And I saw people sitting there, no music, no nothing. They had a Bible, a Bible study book, and the two of them. It was the it was a gym, great acoustics. It was the loudest, most glorious loud I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> and I stood there and I just started to weep. Never forget that. And I said, is what going on here what I think it is? And he goes, yep. He goes, everyone you see is a disciple maker and they're studying the Bible with someone that they built a redemptive relationship with in town. They want them to Christ. 
and they're in a lifelong partnership of studying. And if they haven't won anyone to Christ yet, they've been paired up with someone to mentor them. And before they study at all, every group prays evangelistically before they open their Bibles and they start to study. Every Monday night. And he said the Holy Spirit just keeps saving people. Simple church. Right? So I thought, wow, I think this is what I was looking for. <laughs> you know, we're coupling it with all these things that we're studying, all these resources, all this experience, all this history, blah, blah, blah. I'm still a young pastor pretty much at this time. And uh, I'm still pretty young, right? Um, we're, just, we're just coalescing all this stuff and trying to give it hands and feet for Grace Church. Uh, so we brought the material back, walked our deacons through it. We decided to do an exposition of 1 Thessalonians. We thought that might be a great model church of what disciple making is for our people to learn from, and it ended up being good. That's what we normally share tonight in the seminar. And then after we did that study, we just, we just kind of didn't ask. We said, you know, would it be all right with you guys if we took the study material from that church in Kansas City and just studied their material in all of our Sunday school classes at the same time for nine months? Back then they had nine booklets. We decided to have every class seventh grade on up study one of those books a month for nine months. Why are we doing this, Pastor Tim? Well, remember what we heard in 1 Thessalonians. I mean, there's somehow, remember what we've been learning about from the life of Christ and God's command to you to be a disciple maker. I'm just trying to figure out as a pastor how to, how to oversee you so you can understand what it means to be a blessing of a disciple maker. I said, all I'm trying to do is put before you resources that we can study so we can know how to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you and at the beginning of those studies, pray evangelistically. It's all I know. I'm green at this, you know. All I know is it's my job to help you become a disciple maker. So we did that for nine months. The fourth Sunday of every month, we, seventh grade and up, all met in the auditorium, and we reviewed those books that we had learned together the first three weeks. We all stayed in the same lessons, the came content, right? At the end of those nine months, I said, okay, next Sunday after the morning service, we're not having an invitation. We don't do invitations at Grace. We don't need invitations anymore. Um, I said, any of you that want to take the next step in trying to figure out what this disciple-making thing is, just come on up to the front and we'll start figuring it out more together. So after that service that next Sunday, we said, hey, look, remember... If you want to take this next step in our journey of figuring this out, because we've no by any means arrived, come on up. And we dismissed everybody. People trickled to the front. I thought maybe we'd get two or three. Um, we got 30. Church back then was probably running about a buck 60, buck 80. We'd go over 200 on Easter Sundays. We got 30 people, 29 of them were women, one man, and none of our deacons. People say, weren't you upset? No, I was overwhelmed. <laughs> wow, 30 people. I couldn't be upset with my deacons, my goodness. I wasn't a disciple maker as their pastor. How could I expect them to be? I was just overwhelmed there was 30 people who are going to want to try to figure this out together, you know? And so the only thing I knew to do next was take these 30 people, buy them some time, carve out some time. It happened to be during a regularly scheduled service on a Wednesday night because we only have so much time. And gave them a room. And for the next nine months, the goal was for them was to repeat the study of what they did in their classrooms, only together one-on-one, -on -one, 
through the same material. And none of them were frustrated with that. None of them said, well, we got to study this again. Because it wasn't going to be in a group setting, it was just going to be one-on-one. Because what we found out is people aren't used to studying the Bible with someone else one-on-one or one-on-two. They're okay in group settings or small group settings. But Jesus' make disciples commission was personal. Right? And so I just had to figure out, ask God wisdom, how is this going to function in the building of, of the model he wanted for grace? And And all I can tell you is, listen to the whole seminar, either at our place or here, and and you'll see how God grew that. Those were just the baby steps. That grew over time. The major component of that growing is the starting at the beginning of classes or services with, okay, what's the good news about the good news? So it's, oh, wow, well, hey, you know, in a prayer meeting with 80 people in it, right? Right? our Wednesday night prayer meeting. What's the good news about the good news, folks? I'm going to start with my friend Tom. You guys know he was my 8-year-old son, now 20-year-old son, Caleb's baseball coach. And I've been building a relationship with him uh, for all these years, 12 years. And um, I got through the whole gospel with Tom again, and he's not saved yet. I want you to pray, because we're having lunch again this next week, that Tom would come to know Jesus as a Savior. Right. Next. Have a friend, hasn't gotten saved yet, just met him, haven't even gotten to the gospel yet. Pray that God will give me wisdom on how to build a redemptive relationship with them. Great. Write down their name. Yeah, my discipler and I are already praying for her or for him when we meet together, when we disciple, and then we study. It's just good news. What's the good news? It, let, it let, just lets everybody else know that it's everybody's responsibility and opportunity to be in an in, eternal influence, okay? Um, so that really became a culture setter for us and kept us accountable to that clothesline too, right? So over time it developed, it's still developing, <laughs> I was telling our brother, it's like, you feel like Apostle Paul in Philippians 3, right? Never having felt that I've arrived, right? But this one thing we do, always striving towards Christ's likeness. And the farther you get into this, the farther behind you feel you are. So I hope that's encouraging. (laughs) Woohoo! Anyways, so what we did was, and you've just put out your own first version of something like this. We had to have resources. We had the Bible. That's always the main resource, right? And that's what our disciples do together. They're on Bible reading plans, and they read through the Bible together during the course of the year. But it's okay to study resources that are systematized truth about the Bible, right? It's okay to do that. There's some good resources out there. And um, we had those nine books from them. After a while, we found out we felt we could do better for our people. So we wrote the Foundations book that you folks are aware of. Those 12 lessons. And so if I'm working with you in a factory for 10 years, you finally get saved. Basically, my pastors equip me and given me resources of what I'm going to study with you for the rest of my life with you. It's not up to me to come up with it. We can read the Bible together. Always the top priority. But my pastors added on to that resources about the Bible from milk to meat and everything in between that we're not in a sprint. This is a walk. We're going to study together. And he's going to carve out time for me on a Wednesday night maybe. And he's going to give me a space on property where I can disciple you through those materials. But before we study, we're going to sit down and I'm going to say, hey, who can we pray for that you're trying to see come to know Christ? And, and we pray. And then we study. Right? I'm just telling you, in that, sim- in that simple discipline, the Holy Spirit blows His wind into that intentionality. And all I can tell you is we haven't had hundreds of people saved, but we have had people saved consistently for years. Eight out of the 12 months of every year, we have someone baptized. 
Not a lot. Could be one, could be four, could be five. It just, we keep testifying, we keep praying, we keep studying, we keep going. And our people know now that we don't invite people to come to church before we invite them to come to Christ. Because the church is not a saving agency. It's a going agency. And so we tell our people all the time, please stop inviting people to come to church. All you're doing is confusing them because of 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural man does not receive the things of God because they're foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they require spiritual discernment. The natural man is the sarkikos man. That's the Greek word for the flesh. He's a fleshly person. And they require born-again experience where they become a pneumatikos man, a man of the Spirit of God. They can't understand the Bible until they're saved. They just can't. So when they come to church, if you're a Bible-preaching church, it's just going to confuse them and frustrate them even more. And by the way, folks, the church becoming a saving agency is the first step of the beginning of compromise. Because if you think about it, if you're going to invite people to church, that begins the slippery slope of you always having an attractive place for them to come. And you have to have an appeal. And you have to give people what they want in order to get them to come to church to hear what they need. And when you invite the world into the church more than taking the church to the world, your church is going to become the worldly place because the world is not going to become the godly place by you bringing them into the church. It just doesn't work that way. So that's the slippery slope of compromise. And that's where we get ourselves involved in attractional model churches of every kind. And marquees say, come worship with us. Come join our worship. And you know what? They can't. Unsaved people can't worship. Did you know that? They can't. until they're made friends with God in Jesus Christ. Then worship is, only believers can worship. Right? So my job as a pastor is to equip you to go deeper in the Word together, and then we pray about going, and then we go out. And if they trust Christ, then certainly they come in And we have resources for them to study, time to pray, and we carve that out. So what we do now, we just had the foundation, those nine books at time, and then it became the foundation. Then as we began to understand the practical reality of this, we put together a whole map for our people. Um, And over here it says new birth, and over here it says last breath, right? Right? So from the moment you're born again until you breathe your last, if God keeps us in the same church, I know what I'm going to study with you from milk to meat and everything in between, right? Now, these are just sample resources on this page. We're, we're, we're developing a whole computer database of resources that we're going to be able to make available to every church that wants it, right? Um, many hands make light work. And on the front of this page, it's your disciple-making life. It's not Pastor Tim's disciple-making life. It's yours, right? And on the back, we have this little graphic with the number one stamped behind it. It's everyone win one. Everyone lead the person you have won until you, while you wait to win one, you should be following somebody. And then we added take one. We provide one extra class a year for the whole church to take to strengthen their spiritual doctrinal muscle because you can only take the person you're, you know, leading as far as you are spiritually. So we're always trying to tone that spiritual muscle. But it used to be everyone win one, lead one, follow one. That's easy. 
Make it, make it that your life's pledge of allegiance to win one soul and then lead that soul, shepherd that soul through the word. And while you wait to win one, you should attach yourself to someone to follow and maybe even someone to lead as we pray evangelistically. That's hard. It sounds simple, but it's hard to maintain that and to trust that simplicity that God's going to use to build his church as he's called you to be a disciple maker. We've taken the foundations now and we've broken it down into three children's books, children's foundations. So our people are asking their kids, friends, parents that play at their houses all the time if they can do a Bible study with their kids and they take them through the gospel in a children's way. So this is the foundations and children that's available. A kid in our youth group did the artwork for the cover for all three. And um, so we provide the resources and we provide the time. Now we have people discipling each other during Sunday school, right? COVID took away our evening services, but what was really interesting, COVID didn't shut us down because we were a disciple-making church. A lot of churches throughout the country had no idea what to do during the shutdown. If they couldn't do their Sunday school class or work in the nursery or usher or serve, or clean. What's my value? They hadn't been building redemptive relationships in town, so when everyone's closed down, they have no one to contact. COVID was a, one of the most, gl- made the lack of Christian disciple making in our country most glaringly obvious. Because churches were truly shut down. 20 years ago, we would have been truly shut down. COVID did not shut us down. People that were out there actively building redemptive relationships with lost people, now those lost people are calling them and saying, what in the world is going on in this world? I'm scared. Right? They had that contact already. They're discipling a new believer. That just continues. It just do it over a screen. We didn't shut down. We ramped up. Does it make sense? No virus can shut down disciple making. (laughs) Jesus builds his church and he didn't have any qualifiers, but not in the years of a pandemic. But for so many churches, it did. Thousands of doors closed. Hundreds of Bible-believing churches' doors closed because they didn't have a disciple-making philosophy from the get-go. So anyways, God will give you the wisdom with your pastor and pastors to, to, to build the culture here to make sure that your pledge of allegiance is always to the clothesline unto the glory of God. And the, and the, and the drumbeat, Right? I was over in England for our honeymoon years ago and I remember going to Buckingham Palace and watching the changing of the guard and the bagpipe corps. It always a matter, whenever I see a bagpipe or hear a bagpipe corps or see it, it always is amazing to me, right? The, the, the drummer always has the same beat for every song. Did you notice that? <laughs> right? And really the beat's for the march. It's not to the song. Right? But that's what disciple making is for a pastor, right? And it might get bothersome to you to always be hearing this. Pastor, but here. Pastor, but there. Pastor, but what about here? What about there? Pastor! What? Pastor! When the drummer in a bagpipe corps stops, the bagpipes' winds go out. And you know how wonderful that sounds. They sound horrible when they're blowing up and when they're deflating. But the drum's not going until they're fully inflated. And the drum stops when they're deflating. 
right? The church for years has sounded and looked very ugly because it's always trying to inflate or it's being deflated. It's because there's not that from the pastor's life down or from the pastor's life around. Okay? So you guys will figure out what that means for Hudson View. And when you stick to it, those are your fundamentals. My dad was our high school basketball coach. And um, he was a great coach. Old-fashioned disciplinarian guy. Played college basketball himself. And, and he would always tell us there's three fundamentals that if you have any mediocre talent, you give yourself a chance to win a ball game. And we had a pretty, good, pretty talented team. And so he knew that if we practiced these three fundamentals, that we would always have a winning record. So he would go into games. He would say, okay, tonight we're going to beat this team by 40 points. So if you're not up by 20 at halftime, right, you're going to be doing extra laps tomorrow, and I may make you run till you puke. And he was serious. We're winning by 20 at halftime? Or if we're winning by 18 at halftime and not 20, you're going to make us run? Yeah, because I think you guys are that good. If you do these three fundamentals, we'll wipe this team off the court. And we were a Christian school. So to him, beating a team by 60, he could care less. Right? No participation trophies in his world. Right? He said, we'll go beat him up in Christian love. <laughs> he was a competitor. And sure enough, halftime, we're only winning by 15. He goes, what did I tell you guys before the game? We already know some Monday's practice is going to be horrible. And we already know we're probably going to win this game and there ain't going to be any celebrating. Right? Even if we won by 40, because we weren't up by 20 at halftime, it was not good. And he would always say, he would say, Tim, what's one thing of the three that you're not doing is the reason why we're not winning by 20? And I knew. Yeah, I didn't use my, he always taught us that the sidelines and the baselines were the six, our sixth man on the court. You play basketball with five. But if you use your sidelines and your baselines, you actually get invite a sixth player onto the floor. I said, yeah, I, I haven't been using the baseline defensively. My angles are horrible. And I'm getting beat on the baseline. He goes, yeah, stop it. Knock it off. You're one of the reasons why we're running tomorrow. Then he'd go over to my ex-friend, Kent. He said, Kent, what are you doing? He goes, well, I know what I'm not doing. He goes, I've been boxed out three times tonight, and it cost us six points. Yeah, you're getting boxed out, Kent. Box out. <laughs> Box out. Bobby, what's wrong with you tonight? Why are we not? Why are we only winning by 15 tonight, Bobby? Well, coach, I'm dribbling with my head down. I can't see the court if I'm dribbling with my head down looking at the ball. He always taught us dribble with your head up. Keep your head on a swivel. Yep, knock it off, Bobby. We'd go back out there, remember those three fundamentals with the talent that we had. We'd win a game by 40, 50, 60, one time even 70 points. Right? Those three fundamentals are like that drum in the, in the bagpipe core. <laughs> you get a good team out on the court and they could even be losing by 10 when they should be winning by 15 at halftime. And then you're really freaked out. And then the coach just has to take your face like this and say, look at me. What did you not do that you know to do? We call those fundamentals, right? Every industry has the fundamentals. Every industry has fundamentals. From maintenance to broadcasting to pastoring the sports, everything has their fundamentals. Let's get back to your fundamentals. Disciple making is the clothesline. It's the fundamental. It's the lifeblood of the church. Living the life of Jesus. Okay? So just stick with your pastor. Because he's trying to figure it out himself. I'm still trying to figure it out. Okay? And pray. Pray. Start praying every day on your commute, every day on your walk, every night as you fall asleep. Right? Just lift your voice up to heaven and say, God, save the souls of Yonkers. 
God, lead me to those that you're drawing to yourself and lead them to me. God, I want a redemptive relationship. Give me an opportunity to live Christ with somebody. And he'll answer that prayer. I don't know when they'll get saved, but he'll give you that opportunity. He loves to answer that prayer. But we're not seeing the answers because we're really not praying for it. God, give me. Don't give Hudson View. Give me fruit, Lord, that will become part of our fellowship that's following our rabbi. (laughs) And just keep that the drumbeat. And you'll figure it out together. And over time, I promise you this. It's amazing at grace. Unexpected God-intended blessing. And I'll finish with this. It's amazing what you'll find out that you don't need when you have a disciple-making culture. And I'm not even going to get specific with that. You'll just see that. It's amazing. I, I got 100 illustrations of what we found out we actually didn't need when God gave us that culture. We still have some things we don't need just because we can. <laughs> but those were the things we used to have to have. But in a disciple-making culture, it's fascinating what you don't need when Jesus builds his church. And so we'll just kind of go from there. I'm sorry, Pastor James, we're, there's so much more, you know, but you just learn it over time, you know, we're still learning. Any closing comments or questions or any heartburn, any anger, any, <laughs> any, conf- any confusion, anything you want to throw at me, just let me know so I can duck. Yeah. Let, let's see how I formulate this. Um, you mentioned about, sorry, about, um, you know, building those relationships right outside. Um, you know, we learn to, to stay away, right, from, from people that don't have the same beliefs as you yeah. many of the times. Um, how do you draw that line, right? And, and I guess I'm going to give you an example. Having a, we have a boy, right? He's very active, sometimes very athletic too, and sometimes, you know, we tend to meet people that, you know, he plays with other kids or do things, and we tend to to meet people. But sometimes, you know, they ask us to get together, and we know that they might be, you know, drinking or doing many things, and obviously we don't want to be part of it, right? Mm -hmm. How do you draw that line? How do you... How do you step in? How do you move back? Right? Uh, I guess that's, that's part of my question. Right? How, how do you make a wise decision? Mm-hmm. Right? How far you take that relationship mm-hmm. right, with uh, that people mm-hmm. or the, the person? It happens all the time. It happens all the time. What I found out is prayer is not just providing opportunity. It's also protection. And you can take that to the bank. The opportunities that God's going to give you, right, will also be oppor- they'll provide opportunity, but it'll, it'll provide protection. So, remember the story I used yesterday about the people spreading out around us when we go to ball games. <laughs> so that's your first protection: is the indwelling of the Spirit. They're going to know, right? Prayer is going to be the protection. Then your the way you live and the way you act is going to be your protection. And people, because they're made in God's image, though not saved, they have common sense. They're going to notice something different about you. How many of you have had someone say that to you? Why are you so different? Anybody? That and that probably didn't take too long for them to figure that out. So in our in our in our situation because I did everything I could to tell people, not tell people I was a pastor. Right? I didn't want them to know. Um, But in our relationship with our kids, our kids took us to the culture. We talked about that last night. If you don't have kids, there's a gazillion other ways to take yourself to the culture. But we always knew, you know, John 17, 15, Lord, don't take them out of the world, but leave them there 
but sanctify them by thy truth because your word is truth. God's word is that cleansing agent. So that's, that's protective value number four, the indwelling of the Spirit, the prayer, the way you live, the Word of God. And by the time you start to build these relationships, what we've found is people say this more often than not. Hey, listen, I don't know much about you yet, but I know I'm thinking that this is not probably what you'd be interested in. So you're going to come over to our house tonight, but I think there's going to be some things there you probably won't like. I can't tell you, I would probably say eight times out of ten, when they know that you love them, they will protect you like that. You won't have to worry about it. Understanding these four things and then getting into that conversation. Right? The two times out of that ten, the 20% of the time, right? It was just prepping my children and my wife. Hey, look, we're going here. There's going to be things here that don't honor God. Right? Right? If we get there and it's like glaringly obvious where I think it's going to affect my heart and your heart, we're probably going to say thank you. We just got to get going real quick. And we graciously dismiss ourselves without making a scene. There was one baseball pig roast at the end of every season for Caleb's team. And uh, his coach, he's like, Tim, listen, it's a pig roast to begin with, but it always ends in a party. It goes from pig roast to party. He goes, I know you're not going to be comfortable with the party side. I was like, well, time will come, but if you don't see us stay into the, in the evening, you just, just understand. And then he'd say, well, you know, why, what, what? everyone drinks. Everyone gets, what's wrong with getting, why don't you get drunk? I said, Tom, it's just Jesus. I can tell you it's just Jesus. You know, because I don't want my convictions to be his offense. I want Jesus to be his offense. I can sit there and pontificate all day long my convictions to an unsaved person, and they're not going to understand those any more than they they would a sermon if they came to church. Explaining your convictions to unsaved people doesn't is not the gospel. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, right? But Jesus also said in the, great, in, the, in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Let them see your good works, and then they will come to glorify your Father that's in heaven. So we have to be out mixing and mingling. They have to see the virtue. They have to see the good works. We'd bring a dessert to that pig roast. We'd bring a bottle, bottled water to that pig roast, right? Or to the birthday party. We would come. We would give. We would love without compromising our, our standard of holiness. And if they asked us about that standard, we would always, I just trained, just, just, tell them, just tell them it's Jesus. I don't want them to be interested in my conviction. I want them to know my Jesus. It's just Jesus. Because only Jesus can change me that way anyway. <laughs> and what I'm finding out is people aren't offended by the use of the name God. Or it's my faith. My faith, my faith doesn't allow me to do that. That's the easy way out for me. You do you. Well, it's just, it's God. Everyone believes in God or a God. But man, when you use Jesus, there's something about that name. The name above all names. Philippians 2, right? I want him to be the offense. I don't want me to be the offense. Does that make sense? So as you go, go. You'll have all these pre-protective things going on. And we didn't learn this. I couldn't tell you this when we started going. We were couldn't, we didn't know. We'd never done it before. And I didn't know anyone that did it. I still don't know a pastor that's doing what I'm doing. And I'm not saying that. It's like I'm saying I'm freaking out because I don't know if I'm doing the right thing sometimes. I wish I could have someone tell me. Right? I've lost a lot of friends because my kids went to public school starting in the ninth grade. Most of my friends believe it's sin to send your kids to a public school or public college. Right? All of my friends that believe that way prophesied that my kids would be spiritual shipwrecks and either impregnating a girl or getting raped by a guy by now. Screaming over a table, you're ruining your kids and you'll see, just like that, you'll see!
Okay? Lord, don't take them out of the world, but leave them there. But sanctify them by thy word. Your word is truth. We got to go and be holy at the same time. And it's doable. You're not going to win the masses. But you'll see some. And the gospel is never popular. So I don't know if that answered your question. But situation after situation after situation after situation. And after a while, word spreads about you. And the word you want to spread is, wow, those people really love us. And because they love us, let's protect them. 20% of the time is they're weird and let's give them a hard time with it. But most of the time, if you love them, they'll love you back even though they're not saved and they'll respect you. I get more harsh treatment from Christians than I do unbelievers. And then I wonder, are they really Christian? And if they are, they're certainly not disciple makers, right? They've been so in-focused for such a long time. An in-focused approach in church always leads to infighting. And you can mark it down. Every time there's a fight or an attitude in the church, it's because that person or that church has been way too in-focused. Every single time. People that are out-focused, living the life of Jesus, they don't have time for attitude. They're too burdened and layered with winning lost, developing relationships, learning God, leading the lost, learning God, leading the lost, worshiping, yes. It changes your life. changes the nature of the life of the church. And fills it with a joy that I've never even seen before in my life. And believe you me, I don't ever want to go back. But that's how. That's how. And now we're just doing that at the collegiate level. Now we're learning to do that at the professional level. And my daughter hasn't been raped yet. And my children are getting married as virgins. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just trying to do what I can. Yes, sir. Thus, I, I've been working at a Catholic school for 17 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, in 2007, I got saved. Good night, everybody. Thank you for coming. I know it's been long. It wasn't supposed to go this long. Please go if you need to. Get your kids. Don't, let's not abuse them anymore. Yeah. So when I got saved, I was asking myself if it was wrong working at a Catholic school and being in charge of a Catholic church because I'm yeah. the facility director there for the whole complex. It's just your job. And, yeah. and I felt, you know what? God put me here. It's your job. So I'm in this world not all of this world. I'm in a Catholic place, but I, I don't call myself a Catholic. I'm a follower of Jesus. Mm-hmm. So it has to be a reason that I'm here. Mm-hmm. So I took it in the positive direction, like you mentioned. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because I have a lot of teachers sometimes asking me to pray for them. Mm-hmm. And sometimes when they, they ask me, to pray for Mary, then with, without offending them, I tell them that I will pray for them, but I will not pray to Mary for them. Tell them I'll pray to the one with the, the only one with power to help them. Mm. And also I tell them, um, because they look, I mean, like I'm closer to God. So I explain to them, and you I'm are. not as close to God as you are. God is a father that loves all his yeah. children. And sometimes I give the example with two kids. If one of my sons does something wrong, 
I don't want to hear from his brother. I want to hear from him right. so I can express myself to him. And e even if I have to hug him and share my love with him, God acts the same way. Pedro, let me encourage your heart with something. You're, you're not the only one hearing what you're hearing because you work in a Catholic environment. Everyone who chooses to be a disciple maker is hearing the same thing in their office, on their set, on the court. Will you come, will you pray for me? Will you help me? Right? Because there's only two kinds of people in the world. Those who know Jesus and those who don't. Mm -hmm. Right? And people that don't, when, you know they when they know you love them, they'll come and ask. Mm -hmm. They'll come and ask. And then you say, yes, I will. Right? And over time, the more you know them, just say, Would you, you know, what do you know about Jesus? Mm -hmm. I always ask questions instead of make statements. Jesus used the art of interrogative wonderfully. You know? But I want to encourage you that way. That the whole church can have testimonies like that because that's your job, really. It's not your ministry, that's your job, right? Your ministry's here. Employing your gift by the grace of God to build up the flock. And, and all of you have a job. What do you do? Are you retired? Are you still working? I'm still working. Where are you working? I'm studying education at the university. It's very liberal. Where do you work? And you're in production? What do you do? Stage manager. Stage manager. Right. Work, 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 work. There's no one place of work more valuable than the other. There's lost or saved people there. And, and yeah. Yeah, it's true. And if I may just add what I was about to finish. Yeah. So, and you mentioned the same thing that bringing people to church is not the most important thing. And I feel sometimes I could invite them to come to, to my church, but I feel like if they're not saved and if they don't have the, the fire inside of them of Jesus, what's the point? Yeah. They'll come here one day and never be able to bring them back because they'll probably be lost for a long time. Yeah, I think you could invite them to a church picnic, <laughs> invite them to something where there's not preaching, mm -hmm. let them see the love of God among God's people. That's okay, mm -hmm. but I agree with you. I mean, it's hard. It's hard. All right? All right. Got to let you go, folks. It's late. <laughs> so I don't think there's probably anyone in the auditorium except for two families that have kids downstairs. But we don't want to abuse the kids' leader either. I know how that goes. He said, like, you can keep my kids as long as you want. We're going to go get coffee. We'll be back. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. I know it was a drink from a fire hose. You've been most kind. And if we can come alongside your pastor and help you, that's all we want to do. We want to be givers and not takers. And uh, just really thankful for you folks. We pray for you back in Mentor. I'm excited to see what God's going to do here in, uh, in the years to come. So, I'm going to close in prayer, but I just want to say one thing. I jotted this down on the front of my notes, and you're probably going to hear me say this more than once going forward. Let's learn this together. What do I often say? We are, we're in this together. I don't have all this figured out. I'm sitting there as your pastor, thinking to myself, I'm the worst one at this. I have probably failed at this more than anybody. But I'll tell you what I'm also sitting there thinking. I want to do this. I want to do what Jesus has left me here to do. I I'm brainstorming myself right now what I want to talk to my wife about tonight before we go to bed. You know, how can we go and do this? How can we hit a reset button and just try this again? This is not new to us. None of this is new to us. The mission has always been the same. 
But sometimes we just need a little more nudge. And we need a, a reset on theology, like we talked about tonight. I don't know if I've ever, I've heard, I told you this last night. I've heard this now three, four times. And I don't know if I've ever really thought about the learning aspect through history and the, the innate position of following and learning that we as human beings have on this earth, just like everybody who's come before us. But what we do have as believers is the opportunity to follow and the opportunity and mandate to invite others to follow. And I'm, listen, I'm still learning this. You're learning it. Let's do it together. I do want to talk a little bit more about how to obtain that 14-hour video. I don't, to this day, I don't know how to get it, but I want to get it. And when I finish Route 66, my plan is to start that study. Route 66 probably has five or six more weeks left in it. We'll get in good into the fall, and maybe we'll kick off this more intensive study of disciple-making. Why? Remember why? So that we can go do this. So we can do what Jesus has left us here to do, because take a deep breath and breathe out, and that's about as quick as our life is sometimes. What are we doing with it? Let's glorify God with it. Amen? So let's do it together. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the past two nights. We thank you for the clarity. We thank you for the plethora of information that we've seen from such clear teaching from your word. Lord, we pray that in the life of Hudson View Baptist Church, you would do something that only you can, that you would do something that clearly glorifies you and exalts Jesus. And Father, if you'd see fit, use us to be a part of that. What a privilege. Lord, I pray that you'd protect and provide rest for and just the, the wherewithal to get back into the saddle in his own ministry for Pastor Tim as he heads out early in the morning. Lord, we do thank you for him. And we look forward to just saying see you later and continuing this journey together. I pray for safety as we all go home tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Last night I said let's do this all over again tomorrow. Let's don't do it tomorrow, okay? No service tomorrow night. You take some rest. Um, food's on you tomorrow night, not on us, okay? All right. And you go and enjoy your families. You stick around in fellowship or you may go, but good to see you.